on this episode of the Ritual Misery Podcast, we have teeth. Dog beds, they're a thing. Audio problems exist. IBM workstations are interesting? Uh, I hear the question in your voice. Um, Plex on Drobo, now that is actually interesting. And IEEE 1394 Alpha. Oh boy. Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 207 for Thursday, the 21st of March, 2019. This is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos and uh, this is Rich and I totally screwed up his shot because I don't have his window hey. properly. See, I didn't even have to go derogatory <laughs> on you, I went derogatory on myself. <laughs> I'm just a giant sweaty head. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and now it's not even working right anyway. So how are you, man? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm leaning I'm leaning into the camera here. This is super. Uh, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm privileged to be bl- blown up on the screen here. I'm going to just hide now. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that that is your official welcome to the Ritual Misery because uh, there's always something I forgot to do, <laughs> and in this case, I don't know why why is chat showing up on the wrong side right now. This is so if I go here, that's not supposed to show chat over there. It's supposed to pop it up over. Here. Why are they changing my Skype? Why are these jerks changing my damn Skype? I know I know Skype changing randomly and it being totally incomprehensible. That's never happened before. E, e, no, you're right. That's uh, that's it, well. I'm gonna go with irrepressible or ir- <laughs> irresponsible. Uh, here we go. So now you're now that you know, now you're way big. Uh, now I'm aud- dominating the shot as I should. <laughs> Audio listeners, uh, be glad you're audio listeners. Uh, <laughs> Don't be. I'm, I'm getting a, a crash course here about how the uh, open broadcast uh, software works. Yeah, so this no, is great. That's legit. Unfortunately, they're not seeing it. They're just seeing the results of me screwing with stuff on the screen. Um, well, let whatever. me just tell you, he's moving it from 1075 pixels uh, to 152 <laughs> pixels, and he's moving it over uh, three degrees here. It's it's gripping radio, I have to say. <laughs> it really or is. podcast. What, it, you know, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's internet radio, right? That's 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 supposed to be the thing? C- cyberspace radio, actually, I believe is the proper term. Oh, and now that I have another light, you can actually see me in my messy room. All right, cool. Um, so, uh, man, that's... The, the, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not taking off schedule very often, and this one just because has me completely thrown. <laughs> this is this is already already more fun than I've had uh, all day, really. Um, I can't say that though because we did have a fun conversation this morning uh, talking about the randomness of Adobe Audition and the podcasting world. But we will get to more of that here in a little bit. Um, I got to tell you, man, my dog. Do you have a dog? Do you have pets? Are you a pet? I do. I have a toy fox terrier named Buttons. Buttons. That, I'm not sure a toy fox terrier is an actual dog, nor that Buttons it's, is a real it's name. Not, it's not even really a pet. I don't like it. It just <laughs> happens to live in my house and occasionally <laughs> goes to the bathroom when I want it to. <laughs> that sounds about right. Okay, so we're on the same page. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you that my, my dog, Kai... We, we got him some beds. We didn't know what kind of bed to get him. So we kind of got him a, a plethora of beds. One that's, that's like a big pillow, one that's a mat that fits in his kennel, and then one that's just like it's, it literally looks like a bed. And he loves two of the three. <laughs> I'm going to say that he doesn't love the big pillow because he's already pissed on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, you know, to be fair, I mean, if that happened to me, I would be turned off from it as well. Mm. Um. Yeah, yeah we, we tried the dog bed thing, and then it turns out that human bed is remarkably uh, compatible with what a dog's sleeping needs are. Mm. And when you have like an eight-pound dog, it's really not that big of an ask to <laughs> – and also convenient foot warmer. Um, so, yeah, we have a dog bed that sits in my son's room, and uh, the dog goes in there for story time only. That's the only time that dog uses that bed. <laughs> that sounds about right. Great investment. Yeah. Um, so Kai, we, we got the, the big one that looks like a bed. We put that in the living room or the study dining room area thing. He loves that one. He just absolutely adores it. The one that we put in his kennel, he doesn't mind. It's better than the blanket we had in there before. The big pillow one that's supposed to be down here are just outside my office so that he can kind of chill out and you know, while I'm working. Uh, that's the one that he didn't take a liking to. 
And I I didn't know I didn't know there was such a big difference in dog beds, and I was really surprised by the fact that he really like immediately I told him go lay down, and he bam went to that bed, and like he was like <laughs> he he went and laid down, and then he started sniffing it, and I was like okay that's cool, um, but yes, yeah, so dog beds are a thing. That's um, something you should really think about if you're getting a large dog. Is where the hell are they gonna be? You should really get a um, have you ever seen those love sacks? They're just like giant bean bags for adults that can't grow up <laughs> um, And you should just get one of those they cost like seven hundred dollars uh, But you can get like a slip cover for it. It's really great. And they're, I'm not joking. It's like a 12 foot uh, What is it diameter? Yeah, is that no? Yeah diameter um, Bean bag so you can well, just throw a dog on it. It's either diameter the dog probably will piss on it. I would be more mad if the dog pissed on the seven hundred dollar love sack but. <laughs> Well, I wasn't too thrilled about the uh, fifty dollar pillow either, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, it, but it's a different scale of investment, I guess, is what I'm. Yeah, about. I'm not going to spend more on my dog bed than I spent on my dog. That's kind of yeah. where I draw the line. So, like, if you have to rescue, you're like, I have to. Oh, I can only get a bed that's on the curb. <laughs> yeah. I have to get a rescue bed at the same. Yeah. Well, I mean, even with a rescue, you have like an adoption fee of fifty bucks. You know, it's a. Uh, Depends. But I'm saying, so a dog, dog, you find on the street, no tags, no chip, no nothing. You decide to keep this mongrel, this cur for yourself. You will not invest any money in any kind of sleeping arrangements for this dog. Not until he earns it. Like he's got to bark at us and tell us Timmy's falling down a well or something. Like, you know, he, okay. It's, it's, well, it's, rescue situation. This dog has to earn it. I yeah. listen, no free rides. I get it. I get it. <laughs> he's already I getting my, heat. All right. I told my son the same thing. <laughs> Do something. You'll yeah. get off the baby box BF Skinner well, style I mean, when you do. Let's face it. When we when we have kids, we're actually investing in our own future. Like I'm gonna raise you to have a good enough job so that you can take care of me when I start pooping myself. It's like my dad always said. I just want a house on the estate. <laughs> Wow. Um, so what is this uh, This stuff about teeth? Uh, what, what's going on here? So teeth, very exciting news. I'm sure everyone will be gripped to hear this. So I, uh, I have a eight-month-old daughter as long as a 20-month-old um, son. So don't do the math there. Uh, but she just sprouted her first tooth, which is very exciting news because it also means that her face is no longer in pain constantly, which means I get to sleep now. So I'm super excited about this. Uh, also, side effect, it's no longer cute now when she chews on my finger because now it can draw blood. And I think that's her intent now. It's very disturbing. Is, is that not a thing? You don't want the, the, the blood to fall? Like that's I... No, once they're a man eater then at that point. You yeah. gotta, you gotta take them out then. Then they're all Pat Benatar and heart and stuff. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, best case scenario, it is, she is my daughter. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of the big news here is, you know, this major, major baby milestone. We've, we've reached the end of gummy, cute baby. We're now in teething baby stage basically for the next year mm -hmm, about, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have toothy toddler. Uh, which is another which is another bit of awesomeness. Now, there's one other aspect of of babies getting their teeth that you didn't mention, and that's the constant drool that comes out of their mouth uncontrollably. Yes. Like it's not <laughs> something that it's not a choice they have. It's a it's just a reaction that that occurs. Yeah, it's um, I don't know if you're familiar with the child story Streganona, but mm -hmm. involves a magic pasta pot that just keeps making more and more pasta. And that is my daughter's mouth with drool. Like when she's captivated by something, she'll just be staring at something and then just start leaking out of her. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is, this is what they should. This is the parenting video they should show you when you're like, and then you're just like, just instantly like, here, just let me, just let me catch this. Cause I don't want it ruining your clothes. So right. I'm just also going to wipe it on my jeans. Yeah, uh, yeah. You become disgusting as a parent. <laughs> that, essentially. Yes. Um, I, I discovered the whole drooling thing. I was carrying Amber around one day and she's what she turned 19 a couple days ago. So it's been a while, but we, I was carrying her around and I just, I, I was like, man, I am the sweatiest bastard in this place. It's not even hot in here. This, this baby must be cooking my arm. And I looked down and there's just a trail of drool going right into my <laughs> armpit and all down my side. And I was just like, oh, this, that's, oh, that's gross. That's bad. And they will know us by the trail of drool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not even cool drool. Like you can't even put like a UV light on it and make it glow or anything. It's just, it's just. Is that, 
Is that cool? It, I mean, that, that would can be we back better. Up on this premise here, <laughs> that, with, is is like your dream to go to cosmic bowling, and then there's just like drool graffiti all over you. First of all, that's not drool. If it's showing, <laughs> right. if it's showing up under black light, I don't know if that's drool. I don't know where you've received your information. Please do not stay at that motel anymore. There was not someone drooling on that bed. Don't Please let, do not. Don't let them do your laundry anymore. No, no more laundry service for you. No, um, but yeah, that's uh, like uh, no. I was thinking if if they were drooling on you in a, in a glue and black glue glowed. Uh, what uh, anyway? If it if it was luminescent in black light, then maybe you could at least spread it around so that night you didn't have to change shirts when you went out to the club. You just had this yeah. cool like you know art deco. It looked thing like a uh, Batman and Robin like fight scene. Then it would look right. really cool. Right. Yeah. But, and, but it doesn't. It's just it's just moisture that doesn't wipe away with one wipe. There. I mean, it's just one of the other things that uh, make children now, so 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 wonderful. Your, your first one was a boy, right? That's correct. Okay, so uh, how many near misses did you have with the urine stream coming straight up at you? Uh, near misses, not many. Direct hits, battleship <laughs> style, uh, sunk. Uh, it sunk the the aircraft carrier. Um, which is the best part about having a girl. Like if, if you're at all worried about this, I don't know what anything involving puberty is going to be like. I don't know how she will emotionally, assuredly emotionally manipulate me consciously. She's already doing it as a, you know, as a not willing baby uh, in terms of emotional manipulation. Mm -hmm. But that is by far the best benefit uh, of that is that there is no longer just this, this Rainy. fire hose coming at you every time you just crack that thing open it's, it's like, bad it's like, and, and then the, and then the baby doesn't like i, I guess it's going to be dad talk but the baby doesn't even real like the baby doesn't know they're doing anything they're just like i do this all the time it's never a big deal you never make a big deal about it so the baby has no reaction to cue you in that this is about to be happening so then mm -hmm. just randomly you're just like what oh uh, you know, oh god okay <laughs> the day's over i quit so my my three natural children are all girls mm-hmm um, but I, I did, I was around my stepson early enough that, um, I, I, did, I never got direct hit, but I was, there were a few close calls. Most of them were like, I'd get them out of the bath and have them standing there, you know, drying them off. And all of a sudden the towels far more wet than it should be. Well, back in the yes. bath you go, you know? Um, yeah, I've had, then, I had then, the, then the dilemma comes when it's in the bath, you're like, well, we're not even doing anything here anymore. <laughs> Is, do we just end it now? I don't even, I don't what's, even know what's supposed to happen. What's the water to urine ratio right now? Like you have to do the mat, the dad math in your head and figure that one out and kind of, well, yeah, like if I, if I fill it up with more water, that makes it better. Yeah. It dilutes it. Right. That's got to be, <laughs> how about more? So, so cancels pee, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, that's, uh, the, the weakness of the Pokemon, the pee Pokemon. Yeah. yeah the, 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 you got to fight it with a soap Pokemon. Yeah, the, the pee pee mon? Soap, Soapazoid. Irish Springazoid. That's my <laughs> joke. I'm going to stick with it. Fair enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you have that one. Um, hey, I, I know you know this because of uh, off, offline discussions, but man, my audio problems just have not been fixed. And I could not get them to work. So what's happening is my computer uh, will only play through Skype and things like that at 44.1 mm -hmm. uh, kilohertz. I can only get Audition to play the audio back at 48K. So there's like this disagreement. Now, Skype and all these other Windows programs should be able to work at 48K, but they don't. Audition should be able to play back at 44.1, but it doesn't. Definitely, yeah. Um, and I can't figure out... And I even tried to clean install of Windows over the weekend to, you know, clean install Windows, no drivers, no unnecessary drivers, just the ones for the soundboard itself, and it still wouldn't do it right. So I tried a 1394A card, and as Tom Merritt told me on Monday, if you are hoping a 1394A port will fix your computer problems, you've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I forgive forgive my ignorance. I'm not sure. I'm not up on my I triple E spec. Is that is that FireWire or what? What is that? Yes, which brings up another point. Okay, 1394A is actually a retro spec. Because okay. it was originally 1394, and then when the faster FireWire 800 came out, they had to differentiate be the, between the two, so 1394 became 1394A, and 1394B was then the new 800 speed. So uh, just that in itself should tell you how things are going with my audio. <laughs> now, let me, let me ask you a question, um, and forgive me if this seems basic, but is it plugged in? 
Let me tell you. I was you. very glad you were drinking when I said that. <laughs> let me, let me, let me tell uh, So uh, originally I installed the FireWire drivers for the board and the driver at the end of the installation is like, hey, so now you need to unplug, replug, and then power on the equipment that you're, th- for the sure. driver. Unplug, replug, power on, nothing. Unplug, replug, power on, nothing. Unplug, unplug, plug back in, plug back in, power on, nothing. I only have one 1394 cable. So in a desperate hope, I was hoping it was the cable, not the card I just bought and installed, and not the board just having a complete shit fit and saying, you know what, I don't want to do uh, FireWire I- either. <laughs> so <I> went- <laughs> Which is a perfectly reasonable reaction. <laughs> <for a moment. laughs> yeah. So I decided to uh, dig through my cables, and I had one FireWire cable that was misplaced in the wrong drawer. So you can see it right over here on the side. If you're watching on video, you can see these little drawers. I have all my cables separated because of OCD. Mm-hmm. And... Um, one cable was misplaced in the wrong drawer. It's working. It's fine. And I still have the same problem. But with USB, with Skype open and all the other apps, I couldn't change between 44.1 and 48K because it'd be like, oh, oh, we don't know what to do. There's something streaming. We can't handle this. Too much pressure. Boom. With the 1394, I can at least switch on the fly. So I don't have to shut all my apps down, switch it, and then open them all back up. It just flips over and it's fine. So at least at least I got that out of the fifteen dollar card I put in my computer. That is. Have you tried rage quitting? Because that's my would be my <laughs> first instinct. I would just like, it, I would I would eventually just like my wife would just come down and be like, Rich, you just need to walk away. You're you're now just like just hate jamming this cable in at some point it's frayed <laughs> it's, the connector is broken there are so many there are so many fractured uh ethernet cables in, in my house as a, like none of them have the bottom tab they're just all they're just all and i blame philips hue because it's garbage um but uh yes that, that i that would be my my instinct but that is also horrible because i feel like audio is you know, if like you were having an HDMI problem or something like that, there would be a billion forum posts. But I feel like audio is still specific enough that, you know, you, I mean, you have musicians, you have podcasters that have that deal with this kind of hardware on a regular basis. And so the odds of you finding that same issue are, are so much less that, you know, I, I still feel like it's niche enough that it, it makes support for that harder. Whereas like video, like everyone plays video out of a computer. I mean, not everybody, yeah. but it's way more common use case, right? Yeah. I, I even bought a Sound Blaster AE5, their latest Sound Blaster card to get clean audio out of my computer because the onboard sound was shitty. And I installed that and that audio is completely blown out. Like it's coming out four times more powerful than it needs to. So everything's just crackly and junk. And I you can't... just reminded me that Sound Blaster is still a thing. <laughs> Are you, is your desktop set to 256 colors? Uh, no, no, no. I'm up at a uh, 16 bit now, I think. Wow. Yeah. wow. That's, that's <laughs> truly, truly impressive. You know, what you might want to try is, and I've been doing some research on this. This is called a segue. Um, you might want to try hooking it up to an IBM mini workstation because this has been my obsession mm. over the past couple of days. If you look at my, my Chrome history, um, it's the, this very weird set of searches to shady warehouse direct sites. But so I've been I've been, I need a new work machine and I knew, I want an actual like desktop. I've been working off a MacBook uh, Pro, a 2015 MacBook Pro, which is which is great. But there's no upgradable storage or memory. And I'm kind of hitting up against all of those limits that when I bought the machine, I never thought it would have, you know, in 2015. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm working with a lot of big audio files and stuff like that. So I, I just need more storage. I need more RAM so I can you know, stuff this faster. Um, so I was looking, you know, I was like, all right, I've been working on a Mac. Let's look at the Mac mini. It's nice. Like the new Mac Mini is, is was way better than the original. It's like feasible to actually be a work machine, not just. Um, uh, thank you, Squid07. Um, fuck Apple. Okay. Um, it's, not my preference, but it, it, here, it, here it's, we go. It's his, uh, uh, I agree. It, I agree. Fuck Skype too. Yeah. Um, also yeah, totally. for the record. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I was looking at the Mac Mini. I was like, the Mac Mini like is way better. You can upgrade the RAM now. That's cool. Well, you, you can get you Thunderbolt. Can, you can upgrade the like, RAM again. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God. I'm not paying the $900 they want for the 64 uh, gigs. Or I think it's actually $1,200, something like that, whatever. Yeah. But I was like, it's still really expensive, right? Like to get the one I want, the minimum spec, it's going to be 1099 or 1299 or something like that. So yeah. I was like, I was looking around, I want a small computer. 
I still want some upgrade ability. It's mo- like I'm probably not going to drop in a new processor, right? Like I don't have a problem that Apple locks that down. I really don't. I'm really not going to do that. Um, but I am going to want to upgrade the storage and the memory, I think, at some point. So I was looking at like the Intel Nooks. Those are really cool. You know, they're like four by four by two. They're mm-hmm. really tiny, like one liter. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with them, I guess. Um, so those are really cool. My main problem there is they use mobile processors, they're like the 28 watt ones. They're the same things that are found in the MacBook Pro and like high end laptops, but still like a laptop processor, quad core. I don't know. Like to me, and and that is locked in. Like those are those are soldered down, right? So you cannot change that even if you wanted to. Again, I'm not going to do it. So that wasn't a concern, but whatever. So I started looking around for something new and I discovered that, uh, I guess, um, not, I said IBM. Oh my God. Lenovo makes think center workstations. I'm, this is how old I am. I think that like think pads and think center are still IBM. Um, Lenovo makes these really cool, tiny mini workstations that, are amazing. They offer, you know, like a uh, Intel, uh, like 8,500 i5 or 8,700 i7. You can even get them with discrete graphics and they're, they're still smaller than a Mac mini. You can get them with like an RX and uh, like a Radeon RX 560. You can get them up with like 32 gigs of Ram and VME storage. Um, pretty much the only thing you lose out on, I think they don't have Thunderbolt, uh, support. Uh, I think, you know, it's mostly, they have USB-C ports, but they're not Thunderbolt rated. So that can get, you know, like, if, so you couldn't really do like an external GPU, I guess, down the road, which is like the, the main or major benefit. I'm all USB-C or Thunderbolt 3 stuff is super expensive right now anyway, so I wouldn't be doing that. But I was like, I should I should totally buy one of these, right? They're like a thousand dollars, but you get so much more for the money. Seems to make a lot of sense, right? Except no one sells them like Lenovo has them out of stock. All the good ones are out of stock on their website. So I have to I've been going to like weird like warehouse direct or like govconnect.uk or or like dot like like the weird pirate bay uh, uh top level domains that you don't see like it was like a gc or something like that i was like i don't know what country this is they're just gonna immediately steal my credit card but they're these really amazing machines i, I like i don't understand why no one is like if the mac mini is is good why isn't there like a demand, I guess, for like the small form factor on the PC side? It's very really weird. HP also makes like a, some cool workstations. They have like the Quadro graphics, though. So it's like mm. I don't really need that. I don't need the what is it? The ISV certification that you get right. um, with a like a full like a full certified workstation. That's, you know, that's not quite that. But plus you just, don't need to pay like, for I've, that. I've just been totally that. like up, down this weird rabbit hole of dorky business Lenovo workstations that I desperately want to buy. Yeah. Um. So my my thoughts on the, okay, and we'll get we'll probably get to a little bit of Apple here later on, but uh, my thoughts on the Mac Mini are that you they're only selling two models. Yeah, they're only selling the base model for the people that just want a Mac, which is how I got my original Mac, my Mac Mini, the 2010 model sitting here. Or they're selling the very high end server specific models that people are buying like fifty to a hundred of because they're putting them in farms. Those are the only two models, and the, the the first model is the same for everybody. The second model could be different for different people, but they're buying them fifty, a hundred, a thousand at a time. Um, and I think that's all they're selling to. There, there's no middle market for Mac Mini because as soon as you start specking it out at all, you start getting into iMac territory. And then once you're into iMac territory, you start looking at the iMac Pro. And if you're really wanting to go that far, a 5K display with all the damn horsepower you could want built into a single machine. Yeah, it, it they make it very te- like I, I will give whoever, you know, I don't know if it's if it's Tim Cook sitting there with the spreadsheets or whatnot, but whoever is in charge of the Apple upgrade prices is very brilliant in getting you to the point where it's like you spec out that, you know, that the Mac Mini, and then you're like, well, it's you know, it's like twelve ninety nine and like the twenty seven inch iMac, I get this great display. And it's only like 70, you know, it's like it's only an extra four hundred dollars. So but I also get this amazing display. And so I don't have to use this crappy one that I have. And and like it, 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 you're absolutely right, because then you get to there and you're like, well, but I want the good graphics card. Well, and that's going to be twenty five hundred dollars. And then, you know, I can buy a refurb like you start, you know, talking yourself into it. And then then you actually look at your bank account and you're like, oh, oh I can't afford it. <laughs> this is all a joke. Yeah, this yeah. is all a joke. What was that Mac Mini base model? That one right there. That's the one that I can afford. Okay, yeah, we're going to get that 128 gigabytes of storage in 2019. <laughs> Click, buy that. <laughs> that seems like a great decision. Uh, so, like, just let's just glue that right onto the motherboard. Yeah, 128 uh, gigabytes of non-upgradable memory, by the way. 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> luckily, Mac OS is lightweight enough that it can survive for quite a bit of time on that. But um, now I have to ask, because you, you piqued my interest. I have, um, oh, what is it called? A Synology DS18 Plus that I run my Plex on, and I've got uh, upwards of three terabytes of media on there. Our entire DVD collection and um, some other stuff that we've, you know, found um, is all on there, and it runs smooth as butter. You have a Drobo. <laughs> It's a very funny machine. I have a 5N2. Yeah, I have a Drobo 5N2. Um, and I have, I don't know, uh, I recently had to swap out a two terabyte drive for like an old laptop drive. So I'm like, I'm on like three seconds. <laughs> it's going to burn out. Like I'm going to get the notification as we're recording the show that it just burned out. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I got a couple, uh, like 100 gigabytes of media and stuff on there. So Plex out of Drobo is very interesting because the Plex app is quite good. It's very good for local streaming. Uh, if you want to, you know, we were we were watching uh, Game of Thrones on it. It's actually really good for uh, sharing libraries. So I have a couple of friends that we share our libraries mm -hmm. and it has really great networking. It has uh, dual, um, you know, uh, gigabit uh, Ethernet. So it has really great input output. Um, the processor on it, I believe runs at like one Hertz or something like that. It's, it's this little tiny Marvell chip. They made a big deal about it when the five N two came out that it was dual core. Like they were like, Oh, we were so excited. It's dual core, but it's still runs at like 300 megahertz. It's, it's complete garbage. So whenever you, you, unless you are watching something that's record, uh, that's a uh, format in, what is it? Uh, X two, six, four. I don't know. I'm terrible with audio or video formats. I just know when I find things that if it's not an X, Two six four. I have to go into handbrake to change it. But anyway, if it's not in that specific format, you're like, oh, opt make the optimized version for this. This will only take, you know, uh, oh wait, let me look at the estimated time. A week uh, for like a regular. <laughs> move. It, it's not quite that bad, but it's like at point two five x the speed of whatever it is. It's really a joke. Um, the the Drobo itself. I mean. Uh, so I actually uh, reviewed a Drobo. Uh, I, I uh, write for a website called gestaltit.com and I actually reviewed the Drobo 5N2 for them. And my my synopsis for that was it's a it's for people that need a NAS but don't want a NAS. Mm. So if you need something that you can just point time machine at or whatever backup that you have, if you need just like very simple office file sharing, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's great. Like and, and accessing the drive base, super easy, popping things in and out. You can get dual disk uh, redundancy on it. It's really you don't have to worry about like weird RAID configurations. It does like a virtualized RAID. Um, so you can just put in any disks of any size and it's it's no big deal. Um, and it handles it quite well. If you are like someone who's like, yeah, I, I have these very specific apps that I want to run. I'm like, I want to use it as a VPN server or something like that. No, don't <laughs> never ever. Like if you, if you have any pretensions of ever wanting to open a terminal and like SSH into it, into your NAS, don't buy the Drobo. Do, do not do this. This is very stupid. Uh, but if you, if you end up like someone like tells you, oh, you, what you need is it like if you have a business problem or you have a, I don't know, like a home backup problem and like your techie friend says, you need a NAS you should buy the Drobo since you don't already know what an ass is. Nice. That is I, my synopsis. I, I did a lot of research before I bought my Synology and a lot of people hate on Synology the same way they hate on Apple because it's so integrated and, you know, they have their own this and their own that. I've had nothing. The, the only problem I've had with it is that once I finally saved up enough to buy it and I bought it, I put the two eight terabyte drives I had sitting aside waiting for it in there. The next week... Um, Best Buy went and had more eight terabyte drives on sale and I had two more slots. So I bought two more drives and I put those in there and it took a week and a half to rebuild the, 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 the array from the two drives to the four drives. What, what raid scheme are you using on that? Uh, they're, they have a, they have a proprietary oh, they, one that I'm using. Gotcha. Cause gotcha, none of the others okay. really fit my scenario. So using it's basically one drive with uh, redundancy across the other three. Okay. So, so uh, that's actually like a major uh, problem, or not a problem, but like, uh, so I, Gestalt IT is an enterprise IT kind of news outlet. And so we interact with a lot of IT analysts and stuff like that. There's a guy uh, named Howard Marks who does uh, the Graybeards on Storage podcast. If you're super into like geeky storage stuff, please check that out. It's a really awesome podcast. If you're not, like, if, if you're only like a minor storage geek, don't listen to it because you'll be like, totally out of your depth. Uh, but he has this whole, uh, like crazy idea that like raid can like, we, 
raid technology cannot keep up with disk density ever increasing and that's why it's like super happy that flash is becoming more and more cost effective mm-hmm. it's really it's really fascinating but that's like a, that's like a, actually a huge problem uh, in the enterprise for all these like massive rebuild times depending on what your raid config is yeah um and I tried to find out for a long time what the difference was between the DS918. So the DS9 is the ma- the 9 is the maximum number it's of drives. Deep space 9. It's deep space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the 9 is the maximum number of drives accessible by the unit. So in my case it's a 4 drive but you can hook another 5 drive extension to it so it's 9. And then the mm-hmm. the last numbers are the year it came out. So the 918 is the it's a 9 drive system uh, max that that came out in 2018. Okay, fine. What's the plus? The plus is a hardware transcoder. Well, that for, sold me for video. HL, audio. Okay, okay. Yeah. And I I can tell you that I can watch, I can stream four 1080p streams from these uh, Synology into Apple TVs at different points in the house, and none of them will glitch and they'll all work perfectly. And if you're needing to stream more than four 1080 streams in your house, Spend some time together as a family. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing with Listen, yourself? Somebody, uh, you know, really, really wants to watch four different episodes of Burn Notice at once. <laughs> it happens. Uh, that would be my life currently. Yeah. Um, <sighs> speaking of things to watch, we uh, we need to catch up with the um, Stream Team Movie Draft Minute. Take it away. J- Hopefully this works. Take it away, Jay. Welcome to your Movie Draft Minute, presented by DiamondClub.tv for the week of March 11th, 2019. I'm your host, Big Voice Jay. Keeping it short and sweet this week, because there's only one movie out and one team on the board. Teams Virtual Misery, The Vod Squad, Drunk Kids Gaming, Game Night, and Movie Party are tied for last place. And in first place, with a nine-figure debut from Captain Marvel, it's Team Have a Drink with $266.2 million. That's your Stream Team Movie Draft Minute total totals are accurate as of March 20th, 2019. All right, so Have a Drink is killing it right now. They, they're getting $9 million per dollar spent on Captain Marvel. It's totally a blockbuster. They're absolutely killing it. And the next movie to come out is Hotel Mumbai, which Have a Drink also has in the draft. So they're just going to be uh, firsties for quite a while, I think. Wow. Uh, it's, um, a, it's an intense lineup. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good times. Um, and then of course, movie party has their first movie us, which is actually getting a lot of press. It comes out tomorrow. Um, and then we'll, we'll see how it goes from there. We, the ritual misery folks, uh, Kent and I, we don't have anything till a dog's journey comes out in the middle of May. So we're just going to stand by and watch the first half of the season float on by. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. Like, I, I feel like a movie draft like that, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago would be so much it it would be so weighted, I guess, toward the summer. But now, I mean, basically, ever since Titanic kind of jumped the you know the blockbuster movie season coming out in December, mm-hmm. right? I think I have my history right. Yeah. Um, that the the whole kind of I mean, basically, only January is like the complete dumping ground, and then anything after that, I, I guess it has to be because Marvel and and other you know giant blockbuster kind of comic book movies need to be in there. But it's crazy. I don't know. This summer is going to be topsy turvy because there's so many big movies and so many just complete junk movies that are slated to come out. So it'll be it'll be fun. It'll be it'll be good times. I'm very disappointed that Liam Neeson is getting away from doing comically bad movies because um, I heard that one that came out earlier. Like it looked like it was going to be really bad, and I saw the reviews were good, and it made me very upset because I was like, <laughs> I was like, the commuter is like the my perfect like bad movie trailer. I've never seen it. I don't mm. want to ever see it. But I love horrible Liam Neeson trailers, and I I don't need a world where Liam Neeson makes good movies that look bad. I don't need that. <laughs> All right. Um, now it uh, now's the time when we direct people to our Patreon, patreon.com slash ritual misery. If you give a buck and you give a fuck, we will appreciate you and maybe give you a little luck. And that's kind of how it goes. Um, I can't usually come to something way better than that, but I don't care because, well, he's in D.C. enjoying himself. So fuck it. <laughs> Is it usually limerick based? Uh, I, I don't even know because usually when he says it, I tune him out so I can set up the next thing. <laughs> there once were patrons with dollars and they wanted to give shows a holler. They went to a site. Uh, I, I'm done. I'm done. I, I have nothing else. They went to a site, thought, yeah, I just might give a fuck for a holler. 
We already did holler. Oh. Uh, we uh, we're not good at this, all right? This isn't the Limerick podcast. <laughs> Which, by the way, I am totally checking if the URL for Limerick <laughs> podcast is still available. <laughs> All right, Kent's not here, but we're going to go ahead and hit this button right here anyway. Can I please have your attention? In the last 30 minutes, Kent's done something. Now you've got a guess. He was very excited. Kent's game. Play with him. I'm going to play the role of Kent. You're going to play the role of me. A uh, little role reversal here. And I have a seven-question quiz for you. These are all relating to uh, fathers, fatherhood, stay-at-home dads, and the like. And... We are going to go, um, we're going to go by tenths, by 10 percentages. So your, your options are zero to 10 or zero to nine, 10 to 19. Uh, you you kind of get it right. That's yeah. I, so I'll live to I 100. have an abacus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, first question, what percentage of fathers identified parenting as important to their identity? Can I get a, what? Re, okay, I need this. Repeat this. I've been having whiskey. Repeat the question. <laughs> what percentage of fathers identified parenting as important to their identity? Uh, I'm going to say uh, the uh, 65, so, 60 to 69. Okay, so the 60 percentile ish area. Yeah. yeah. Um, that is, I don't have the little dingers and buzzers, so we're not going to do that. Uh, it's 57%. So round up, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. I basically nailed that one. Um, we will continue because it's going to lead into a, a, a different discussion towards towards the end here. What percentage of men say they spend too little time with their kids? I'm going to say the 40th percentile. Um, and you're this time you're a little shy. Uh, 63% of men say they spend too little time with their kids. Okay. That's, okay. That's, I, I, I guess I have a more pessimistic view of what other fathers. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, I just picture like 1950s dads, which is weird. I don't know why. <laughs> Beaver much? Um, Foul. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of working dads feel it is, it, uh, words. Let's try that again. What percentage of working dads feel it is very or somewhat difficult to balance work and family life? I'm going to say 70th percentile. Yeah. Do you find it yeah. hard? Cause I always found it hard. Yeah. Um, so right now I'm between offices. The room I thought was an office turns out, uh, is, uh, baby girl's room now. And so a lot of times I'm working at a dining room table as I am at right now. <laughs> Uh, I am working in a bedroom. I'm working on, you know, on a couch. So it's, it's very, it's less like I'm going to work and it's more like I'm working where people happen to be sometimes. So mm. it's not that it's hard to work, but it's much easier to kind of get out of that world. Yeah. Um, I have a dedicated space and I'm still fighting to establish that work versus home identity with it. Um, so it, uh, I don't, I don't know. The balance is kind of mushed together right now. So I don't know which one's which you know, sometimes. And, uh, but, um, so you said, uh, what would you say? 40%, 70, percent 70%, percent. 70%, percent. uh, you overshot this one a little bit. It's 52. This bastard fathers are just trying to mess with me now. <laughs> it gets worse. Um, what percentage of couples with children, this is couples with children. So we're going from dads to couples. What percentage of couples with children are in families where only the father is employed? Oh God. Uh, couples with children and father. And I, I will tell you that my data is as of 2014. Oh, well, I need you to throw this all out. This was a different, this was Obama's America. Okay. If I knew that you know, a different set of values at that time. Okay. Uh, these, the these, th these numbers aren't trending that far down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to, this one, I'm going to say, uh, 20th percentile. I can't like just a single, yeah, I'm going to say 20th percentile. I'm going to go low. Ding, ding, ding. 27%. Nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. Boop. Um, it's and, like and this is or, this is almost a so back in 1970 it was at 48 percent with only a single father or a single with single income being the father, and 49 percent this the being dual income, 
And now okay. it's at twenty seven percent being the father is the only income, like four percent being the uh, the mother, and then the rest of it is all like seventy percent, some seventy one percent is dual income, and yeah, because like like people need to like pay for mortgages and also diapers, like right. I, I, like I I I mean I if you make that choice, you know you're definitely making, I, I think it's now seen much more as a sacrifice, right, in terms of. Um, as opposed to like assuming a role, you know, mm -hmm. of like, oh, you're you're a mother now, so you're gonna go do kid things. Right. Um. I I think it's like, oh, you're you're making this this sacrifice. You know, you're you're for the family. I guess I don't know. It's it's weird. Uh, not yeah. not weird. I shouldn't say. It's wonderful if you can do it if that's what you want. But the fact that it's that I guess it was so taken for granted or was much more common, um, definitely speaks to uh to a different time. It, and like Obama's America. <laughs> All right, three more to go. <clears throat> what percentage of Americans feel that breastfeeding aside, fathers are better caregivers than mothers? Uh, with, I'm going to go... Without consideration of breastfeeding, how, uh, what percentage of Americans feel fathers are better parents, better mother, uh, better, better caregivers, I'll give you the exact words, better caregivers than mothers? Uh, I mean, like... Were, were there like a bunch of guys that were like, well, I can't, you know, my titties don't make milk, so I'm a real bad. Like, was that I, mean, I, I have to I still have to go really low on this, um, but I, maybe that speaks to sexism. I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to go 20th percentile again. I, I feel like people love the moms. Uh, would you be surprised to find out that you overshot? I overshot. <laughs> Is it zero? <laughs> One As percent. Squid 07 said? One percent. What? Really? One percent. Now, to me, like 20th percentile, I get. One percent? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Give the, now, now I feel like the dad, like this is, this is definitely sex. First of all, this is definitely sexism. And second of all, these, listen, 80 percent of women or whatever are working too. Okay. Guys can be good caregivers. Yeah. Be cool. Yeah, we, we can. Most, most of us, I'd feel don't but we can yeah oh no i mean i definitely don't i mean my <laughs> wife is way better yeah but you know yeah um what percentage of americans say men and women have different approaches to parenting oh um 80th percentile it, oh. i mean it's gotta be up there you it, it's 64 okay yeah. Okay. So, I mean, okay. it's, it's, this is probably the one, well, this one and the one before it are the only questions I thought were right around where I would have answered. Okay. Um, I guess I was, I have too generous a soul. I don't know. Well, we're going to find out because you get your final question here. Oh God. What percentage of adults say it is more important for babies to bond with the father than the mother? I'll give you a hint. It's not zero. This is a non-zero number. Yeah, non-zero number. We know 1% is in play, though, as an answer. Um, as I guess that would be the zero. Would that have been the zero with zero to nine? Mm, okay. No, no, no. Just, um, just, just the number zero is out of play. Okay, just the number and, zero. And the number okay. 100, or they're both out of play. It's somewhere in the middle. I can't, I can't go for green. Um, <laughs> let me think here. Better... What it's percentage of adults lot. say it is more important for babies to bond with the father than for with than with the mother? I think it's higher than I'm thinking, right? Because I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want them to have daddy issues or something like that. You know, keep them off the pole, right? That's the that's the philosophy. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make a prediction. I'm gonna say it's 30th percentile, but I'm gonna say it's like 38. Ooh. Well, I will tell. Let me do some quick math in my head. Beep, 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 beep. You were 36 points off. All right. Okay. And I will give you the choice on whether you're overshot or oh, undershot oh. by 36 <laughs> points. So is it super common that people think it's more important to bond with the father or, l or no one thinks that? I'm going to go up. I'm going to go with the up number. And you would be wrong. 2%. 2% People. of adults say it's more important for babies to bond with the father than with the mother. What the hell? People. <laughs> I'm upset. Jeez. I mean, 
again, this was 2014. So I, you know, uh, yeah, being a 2019 man, it's tough for me to go back that far back in time. This is generations ago, numbers. right? Yeah. It's... Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we were all on Twitter. I mean, listen, I was using an iPhone five back then. <laughs> Do we even know what life was like? Did we even have a camera on our phone back then? God, yeah, come on. Oh, what? I only had 100 megabit per second internet at home. Yeah. It was the stone age, people. Yeah. How can we even put ourselves in that mindset? It was like email, carrier pigeon. It's kind of a tough call. Yeah, you know? I mean, that's why we had to kill all the carrier pigeons. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we at least killed the ones that weren't doves and let them refigure that out. Um, yeah, exactly. So that concludes our, our quiz. I think you did pretty well. And if nothing else, maybe we all learned a little something. I know I did. And those numbers are, like I said, from a 2014 survey by Pew Research, which is one of the few research establishments that I'll actually uh, quote numbers from. <laughs> I guess that, that kind of plays out, though. I mean, if you look at the Mother's Day card, you know, selection versus like the Father's Day, it's just like a generic, you know, it's like a paper yeah. bag. It just says like Happy Father's, you know. It's not even a whole paper bag. It's like part of one. It's like just somebody a just scrap ripped it off. one. They just give it to you at checkout. They're like, whatever, you like, forgot. You flip it over and it says science. You're like, hey, this is, <laughs> is this previously used? It's like, this is, this was a book cover. Yeah. It's okay. It's doodle on it. So you, um, first of all, let me, let me cover a few things. You've already mentioned that you uh, work with and for Gestalt IT. Uh, in various capacities. Uh, mm -hmm. You are a, a prior career man and have recently, uh, well, I don't know how recently, probably what, a couple years now, been more of a stay at home than a the, uh, going to the office kind of guy? No, uh, just uh, this October kind of shifted it up. Um, and uh, it's been it's been a pretty big, pretty big change for me. Yeah. So you're, you're about uh, six months further in the journey than I am on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it... Um, it, it just kind of all the pieces kind of came together, had some opportunities to uh, work from home uh, more and uh, losing an hour commute each way uh, was definitely a big uh, incentive on that. But also, you know, just being able to be there, uh, be there for the kids and uh, and just being able to help out a little bit more, too. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming your wife works full time. Uh, she is actually right now um, staying at home. She's with the kids. Oh, wow. So it's, yeah. it's like perfect ideal situation for everybody. What can I say? Except now you're with your wife all the time. Yeah. Oh, she like immediately like just is like, please go hang out with friends. I don't need. <laughs> please leave the house. I like there. This, this has been a discussion we've had multiple times where she's just like, please have hobbies, <laughs> please do things, leave. Uh, like to like so. Once a week, I'm like I make sure just to even just get out of the house. Like today, we were on a call together and. Uh, uh, I was working from uh, just a coffee shop just because I was like, I need to be around like adults that I don't know. I feel like that is probably healthy uh, <laughs> at some point. Like I should have like I should have like exchanges with people that don't involve like, hey, there is like now there's now poop on pants now. <laughs> like that, that that's like that's like I'm going to say 40 percent of our conversation like in the 40th percentile of our conversations involve bodily fluids. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, it, it it's it's an interesting dynamic um, and it's uh it's, it's, but it's I, like, I would not go back. Let me just put it that way. I would not go back. And, and doing some research today, trying to find some, some data for a quiz, I ran into several articles about just that. Like, you know, once, a, once you go stay at home and you, and you get it figured out and it's working for you, there is no going back. There is something catastrophic has to happen for you to go back to the working world. Um, well, and even more than that, like I've become so, so I'm on like nine Slack teams. It's not really that many, but I'm on quite a few Slack teams and I really enjoy that as a communication medium. Um, I still have like one kind of client that I work with that demands to do everything through email. I don't know why this is a thing like e email has a purpose. Don't get me wrong, but it's not for like internal comms. Um, right. So but uh, but on the other hand of that, I have also now because of the way my work has shifted, I've moved so many more things over to Slack as opposed to like, hey, we're going to do like this one of one of five weekly hour long calls for this one particular business. And so that in and of itself is like, oh, I just freed up like a tenth of my working time just like by not sitting on like con calls and stuff like that. So yeah. um, I would highly recommend even if you can't work from home. Uh, fight tooth and nail to not be on con calls because they will murder you. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, well, in the military, we have meetings. We have meetings, pre-meetings. We have 
pre-meeting meetings and Mm -hmm. then uh, you have prep meetings for the pre-meeting meeting. And then if you get in trouble, you have to go to the meeting that you just had the pre-meeting about and that you prepared for in the pre-meeting prep meeting. And it's like... at least in the maintenance world, we have like a, a weekly meeting where the wing commander or the group commander, the maintenance group commander wants to know all, all about his jets. Mm-hmm. So that's on Thursday. Thursday, nine o'clock. Okay. Wednesday, you have the squadron commanders. They each want to hear about their stuff so they can tell the group commander. So that's on Wednesday. And then on Tuesday, all of the section leads want to talk to their people to find out what's going on so they can tell, well, you know, they can tell pro supers who can later on that afternoon tell the commanders who can, and it just like whatever level you're at, if you call a meeting, there's a meeting for each, and there's at least one <laughs> meeting for each tier below you. So as a group commander, you've got the squadron commanders and then you've got uh, 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 the chiefs and then you've got the production supers and then you've got the expediters and then you got the maintenance folks and the shop chiefs. So, Anytime a group commander wants to have a meeting talking about the job that you're supposed to be doing, there are at least six meetings leading up to that meeting. It, it's, it's, comp- it's, oh my, it, my favorite thing about working from home now and working with you and Jenny is we're like, Hey, we're going to do a Skype call. Okay, cool. This time. All right, cool. Hey, we're going to be 10 minutes late. Okay, cool. Oh, Hey, Skype call happens. We bullshit for 10 minutes about really nothing. And then we get about an hour worth of actual discussion down. We take some notes. We got what we know. We know where we're headed. Okay. And it's all meaty. And then we, okay, business is done. And now we're going to shoot the shit for a few more minutes. And then the call's over and I don't have to like, there's no, Oh shit. I got a three o'clock or something like that with the same fucking people. It's, <laughs> you know, like it's that, done. That's like, insane. Like, so it's like a butterfly effect of meetings. It's, Oh my God. Yes. It's, so like a, ge- a general opens up Google calendar and like right clicks, add meeting and like the, just the whole, like I can just see like the pyramid of cascade yeah, effect of, of it calendar invites. It's so stupid. It is so, so stupid. Um, and then like we have, uh, for training, we, there's a, um, a, a, a group meeting quarterly. Well then the squadron commanders want to have a monthly meeting. So then you end up with the chiefs and the pro supers or not not the pro supers, but the chiefs and the section chiefs having a weekly meeting to prepare for the monthly meeting so they can be prepared for the quarterly meeting. And it's like, uh, really? I, I will say, I will say like having regular meetings, like as a, as someone who has experienced like large, medium and small kind of businesses, right? Uh, I've worked for, offices that have had a hundred people and, and worked in a small team on that. Uh, my team with Kishalt IT is much smaller than that. So it's, it's, it, that's a very different experience in and of itself. And then, you know, I've worked for a nameless faceless companies, you know, in my time. Um, so there are value, especially when you have, you know, smaller groups, there are values in like having like set regular meetings, if nothing else, like accountability, like just the ability to be like, like in front of a group being like, Hey, did you have a chance to like send that email that you totally said you were going to send? You'd be like, yes, I'm sending it right now. But then there's, there's also the, all the other people around the table, right? Where this conversation that one, like one person is having to another person has nothing to do with them. And like, it's, it's like when meetings turn into a series of conversations like that of one-on-one conversations that you're having as a group to put group pressure on people mm-hmm. and then you're just wasting everyone else's time for 90 percent of it that's where it becomes so incredibly frustrating yeah we we were uh the commander was uh i think it was the wing commander was half an hour late one day to a meeting everyone else was there on time we had squadron commanders in there um chiefs shirts i mean it was, it was a big powwow and me and a couple of my other more cynical uh, uh brethren we started doing the math on how much money was being wasted each minute that we were there, <laughs> not actually doing anything. Plus the 15 minutes or so that it took everyone to arrive at that location and the, all the rank, cause it was a very rank heavy room. And you know, as you in the military, as you go up in rank, you go up and pay. And we calculate like that 30 minutes cost the air force something like $33,000 of just completely wow. wasted time with all the people in the rank that was in there. It was ridiculous. 
Now, is that a common occurrence? Is is tardiness? First of all, I, the, the qu- bigger question I have is in the Air Force, how often is the phrase synchronize your watches used? Never. Never. No. I'm very disappointed. No, I mean, it might, it might be for like some spec ops stuff, but for daily, mm-hmm. no, nobody, nobody. And besides, it's all iPhones now anyway. iPhones and 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 Android phones that are synced up to NST or something. So it's you don't so you don't have like a like a, a Breitling or a, a Amiga, a Megawatch or whatever. Yeah, no, that's not how it works. No, no. I, am I, have I been misinformed by how by armed Hollywood forces work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. What? No, I, I've done deep research on this. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, all the movies you can watch, you'll you'll get maybe ten percent of what actually happens in the military. Okay. This um, this yeah. this does check out. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's it's in, in meetings. It's God, it's it's meeting hell. I kn- I know people who right now will sit at their desk actually doing their job for four hours a week, and the rest of the time is all meetings. Now, does uh, do they get any kind of I guess workman's comp or disability for the part of their soul that gets lost? As no, a result of that? no, that's that's not even uh, not even part of the the VF uh, the the veterans uh, schedule. So it's so, not considered at all. So the, the one thing I will say that is a, a weird has been a weird transition for me a little bit in terms of working for like doing the one job and then having a job as part of multiple clients who all have different requirements and stuff like that. Um, and, and kind of running your own business at the same time is that there, you do miss the, and even just working for a small company, I should say, even to this is like, it, there is a certain amount of comfort in just being able to be like, Hey, I can show up. I do this job. Someone else has to worry about marketing. Someone else, you know, like Mm -hmm. all of the, the, the business process stuff, all of the, what do we charge for this? Like I, I, I've never had that, uh, situation before. Right. And so going into that where it's like, oh, now all of a sudden, like I have to worry. It's it's not even like worrying about like the plumbing of, of doing a business or stuff like that, where it's like, okay, now I have to learn about like legal and HR and that kind of stuff. It's just like not having someone to punt the answers up to mm-hmm. is a weird sensation. And I imagine, you know, maybe coming from the military where it's like, that's like literally the entire structure, you know, that, that might be something, uh, you know, that you, you would feel as well. Well, so my, my big thing for a long time now has been, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of salary pay, not mm-hmm. a fan of it at any level. I, it, it just doesn't really make sense to me. I'm a fan of, and I'm not a fan of hourly pay or either. I think those mm-hmm. two are, are two, uh, two flowers from the same poison tree. Um, I want to be paid by production. I want to be paid for the actual product, whatever product that is, the actual product that I produce. Per widget. Per, per, yeah, per widget, per, uh, per, per gear, per whatever. Like that's, uh, you know, I want, I want to get, I want to get paid for every sprocket I put in the bucket. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I want to do. That's, that's how I want to work. So, and in, in that case, it, it doesn't matter to you if I'm not putting enough sprockets in there. It matters to me because I'm not getting paid for it. In fact, if I escape on a few sprockets, that's a couple more sprockets you can do. And then you can make your pay go up like that. And that seems to me like, you know, it's, it's a, a an economy of effort as opposed to, um, a, a economy of time payment. I mean, there is a, a certain trade off of that because I, I think we both had situations where we know going in that like, we're going to take a bath on something because we want to maintain like this relationship with a particular client or something like that, where you're like, okay, you know, the, the cost for this is the equivalent of like, I guess, you know, if you want to say a certain amount of dollars per, you know, if you want it, if you want to quantify it, I guess, mm-hmm. in terms of like how, like how many hours this should take versus how many hours it's going to take, right. you know, most of the time you charge roughly, I would say roughly equivalent to what you would want as an hourly wage, right. For, for working however many hours you want to work. Um, and again, that is kind of the benefit of client-based work is that you can take on more stuff. You have the, you have the freedom to do that, right. That, that's, that is a, like a privilege of, of being able to do this is that you can take on more work if you're willing to, I guess. But the, you know, the downside of that is like, there are some times where you're like, well, I have to do this because if I don't do this, they won't come back to me. Right. To do this. Mm-hmm. And then, but it's like, I know this particular one is going to take me three times as long because of whatever situation. And then, you know, you just, you just kind of have to bite the bullet on that one. Again, it, it just kind of comes with the territory, but that sometimes can be a little, little hard to swallow. Yeah. And I, I know because my, my point of reference is there's a lot of people in the military that just aren't pulling their weight. They're just not doing their jobs. I'm guilty of it, at least for 
part of my career. Like I think everybody goes through phases, but there's some people that have made a career out of not doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, let's for reference, they're all heroes. Thank you for your service. You're all heroes. So I just need to say that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you say that because I don't. Okay. Because, <laughs> because in my experience, my my opinion might differ a little bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are far too many of them that, are, that that start their careers as a paycheck and end their careers as a paycheck, and there's no honor, duty, or uh, a, a semblance of anything honorable in the between. Um. There are too many people that are getting a full paycheck for not doing half the work that the guy next to them is doing that's getting the same paycheck. And that just irritates the piss out of me. And I'm not I'm I'm not gonna go in my tirade about AFSCs and different jobs and everything else. But for me, my driving force is if I get this done, I get paid. If I take nine hours to do it, I get paid X dollars. If I take three hours to do it, I get paid X dollars. You know, if I can get three of them done and then I get paid three X dollars because I've gotten three of them done. And that's kind of the way my mind works. And I understand that's very subjective. Some people are like, I just want to show up at a place and I'm trading my time. I'm not training my, my ability. Whereas I've always been a, if you want bricks moved, don't pay me eight for eight hours of work. Pay me for the number of bricks I've freaking moved. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I've, I've definitely worked jobs where I've, I worked for a, a bankruptcy and foreclosure law firm where we worked on the side of big banks, uh, from, uh, around the time of Oh nine, which, uh, oh. there was quite a few bankruptcies and foreclosures at that time. Yeah. So it was really inspiring work. And that was a job where I showed up and I, 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 they had a super dehumanizing hand scanner to clock in. So you had to put your hand under there and punch in a code, made you feel uh, like you were a complete cog in a machine. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, that was like, I was like, I'm showing up. I'm, it's not that I'm not going to do the work because, you know, I, you know, I, I had a, a team that I worked in. Um, I didn't dislike all of them. Um, so I, and I didn't want to screw anybody else over. Right. So like, I'm going to do my job, but like, I'm also not like going to, you know, you're, you're getting this base level of effort from me because there is, you know, I, I had, I'd, I'd say I had no passion for it or anything like that. And you know, there's a, there's a, there's only so much that like, you know, I, I have a certain sense of pride, right? I don't want to do bad work necessarily or anything like that. But when you, I, I don't know, I, I feel like sometimes you just need people to show up. Like I, it, it's, maybe it's kind of sad that, you know, they say like, what is it like, what's the saying? Like half of a, something is just showing up. Mm. Um, but you know, for some, for some positions, for some jobs, you know, maybe not in the military. I, you know, I, I, I don't have experience with that, but sometimes I feel like, you know, some positions are designed like just to have a body there is enough. And if that's what you're paying for, that's what you're paying for. Yeah. But if like you're... the guy that holds the sign outside of the furniture store that's constantly closing, oh like my God, that yeah. guy just literally does need to show up. Or the the guy that stands at the corner that's advertising for Little Caesars Pizza and plays it like an air guitar and yeah. bounces his head, that guy just needs to show up. Or okay, or, or Liberty. He's tax. not getting paid for how many people he brings in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and that's and that's valid. That's fine because you're actually literally being paid for your time. You're not being paid for your effort. Now, yeah, if true. if they're gonna say uh, your job isn't to hold the sign, your job is to attract customers, then it's totally different. Like if I'm, mm -hmm. if my job is to stand behind this counter to make sure no one steals some shit. Okay, cool. You're paying me for my time. Now, if you pay me to sell stuff, well then I should probably get a little bit more if I'm a little bit better at selling things. If I'm going through and reading books on salesmanship and, and I want to sell more cars or more t-shirts or whatever, don't pay me the same as the dude that's back there drooling on the broom. <laughs> well, and I, I, and that's why I think having a smaller team and having smaller organizations is really beneficial because then you can set up incentives where, okay, like, you know, if you, like I, I worked with a, a six person team, right? And so we had quarterly bonuses. So if you, you know, if you, if we did great in our metrics or whatever like that, everyone, you know, got some help out. If you came up with a really good idea or if you, you know, if you, uh, you know, we were, so we do a, a event organization too at Gestalt IT. And so if you sign up a, a new company, that's going to be a presenter at this event or a new event sponsor or whatever, um, you can, you know, that helps everybody out. And then you also have your own, you know, quarterly bonus. So like there is, you know, it was kind of a, it was a salary position, but it was also did have some incentives built in, maybe not as clear perhaps as I would, you know, it would have been nice to have been like, Hey, if you bring in a client, you get 
this value, this definite dollar value added to you. Maybe that would have been nice, but I, I do think when you have a smaller team, you can set up the incentive. So you could still have that, that kind of hourly, you know, or hourly or salary, like, Hey, show up, you know, this base level of comfort, but there is a reward for, for, you know, maybe doing a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I had, I had a question though. So I've been doing a lot of research. Um, I listened to the five thirty eight podcast because, uh, I like hearing Nate Silver kind of shit all over everyone's political chances that aren't Joe Biden. And, um, <laughs> I, uh, so they were, they were joking around about, uh, the candidate Andrew Yang. Are you familiar with him by chance? I heard the name. So his big thing, he's like, you know, he's your, um, your tech kind of CEO kind of candidate. He's actually been announced since like 2017. He's just been like kind of floating out there. Um, but his big thing is universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of plays into this conversation. And I, I, you know, I think it's an interesting idea, but what was really fascinating to me was kind of digging into the history of that. That Mm -hmm. is, this is not like a, like a new, like, you know, Silicon Valley, like, Oh, you know, you hippie or whatever. Um, that, very practically in the United, like it, it goes back, like people had this idea in like kind of utopian circles in like 19th century Europe or whatever. Right. Um, but that the idea that, uh, uh it, it very came close to pass in the 1960s, uh, of a, of a universal base, or I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry, in the 1970s under, uh, Nixon, it actually came very close to passing. And the only reason it didn't is because it didn't go f- like it got defeated by Democrats in the Senate because it didn't go far enough according to them. But it was very right. weird to learn that, uh, something that would seem to be a very liberal policy of like, literally, if you're not familiar with universal basic income, it's the idea that every adult in the U S if it's implemented in the U S, uh, gets a certain dollar value that's just deposited into their bank account. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, other, you know, you, you just are guaranteed a certain amount of income, uh, you know, regardless. Um, and the idea being that, okay, that alleviates concerns and that would supplement any kind of other welfare system or, or, you know, anything like that. So you would use that to, you know, pay for someone to watch your kid. So there wouldn't be any kind of, you know, uh, uh, daycare, you could use it to pay for education, you could use it to pay for the doctor, whatever. Um, or, or you could use it to save up and start a business or, or something like that. So there's there's all sorts of weird incentives to that. But the idea that that is, was originally a Republican idea, admittedly, the Republican Party in the 1970s was not quite the dogmatically conservative party. It was a smaller, you know, it was a, it yeah. was a different time for the Republican and the Democratic Party. There was a lot more crossover in terms of, you know, small government, big government ideology. You could argue that if you look at his policies, I mean, Nixon's very conservative socially, but not necessarily fiscally, whatever. It gets very complicated. But the idea that that was a Republican idea in the 70s is like crazy to me you know, in, in our current political climate. And so Kent and I talked about this um, a couple of years ago, uh, the night I was the night before I left Korea. So May of 2016 or so. Um, and. I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos from back in the seventies and I think even like the very late sixties where people were starting to think about it and, and kind of seeing how it could come to fruition. And it really amazed me how simple their, the possibilities were. Um, and the ideas against it are kind of, fucking out there to be honest with you. Like, it's like, Oh, that's just going to cause everybody to be lazy and this and that. Well, we're, you know, somebody's got to try it to see if it works or not. And oh, by the way, they tried it in like Sweden or Norway or something like that. And you know what? <laughs> it's working fine. It's, it's doing exactly yeah, what I it's mean, meant to the, do. The only, I guess the question I have, and I'm, I'm sure smarter people than I have clearly, like this is the first thing that comes up when you think about it. It was like, would this cause inflation to the point where, or, or if, if your society is hit by inflation, then the universal basic income becomes much less effective, obviously, as opposed to a, you know, a government guaranteed benefit. So it's like, okay, so if you're on Medicare or something like that, that is less impacted by inflation than getting $10,000 into a bank account every year or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure economists have thought about that, right? That's, that's like a very basic concern. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the, the big problem is, right, is that, um, anytime you're talking about, changes to socialized medicine or, or implementing socialized medicine or, or any kind of big government program like this, anything that's going to affect a huge swath of the economy. Yeah. You can, you can make all these academic arguments that, or, or, you know, can you point to all these economic papers, you can point to these small scale tests in Sweden and Norway, but then you're talking about like a fifth of GDP or something like that. that, that that's a big swing to have to take. And I think 
as a society, you know, we're 50 years out from sending people to the moon, right? Like mm. we've, we've kind of scaled back from these big ideas for better or worse. Um, and probably, probably, probably for worse. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we, we just seem way less, uh, capable of taking these big swings or, or having, yeah. I think these, these larger visions. Yeah. And honestly, my answer to the whole thing is, uh, uh to get rid of income tax. Okay. Um, and tax ha- have a standardized tax code, a very simplified and standardized tax code where you are taxed upon tax based on the necessity of the item. Mm-hmm. So things that the FDA say, these are necessities. You got to have, you know, your, your generic brand bread, you got to have your generic, uh, uh, milk, uh, your generic diapers, those things, there's no tax. You, so you wouldn't pay on, on basic substance or subsistence items, the generic foods and the, you know, th- that kind of stuff. You wouldn't pay uh, a tax on those. Your Amazon basics. Uh, well, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm I'm looking more like the things that you can get with yeah, the, for the bare yeah the bare essentials yeah games. those those like your generic the toilet angel paper. soft toilet paper if yeah. you want that quilted northern you got to be you got to pay a little tax right and then it just scales it goes up and in scale according to what you purchase mm-hmm. um so if you buy like a luxury yacht it's a, like a seventy five percent luxury tax which is kind of what it is now so if you want to buy a, a, a million dollar yacht that's going to cost you one seventy five. You know, and uh, you, you you deal with that because that's, you know, if you don't want to pay that much tax, you just don't buy the big stuff. And by default, that will cause more taxation on the people with more means without being something that they can't budget for. And, and also, by the way, simplifying the tax code. I could see, I mean, obviously, the problem then becomes like coming up with the brackets, right. For Mm -hmm. how different, you know, different like degrees away from necessity, like how many standard deviations from necessity Mm -hmm. this, this thing becomes before, you know, depending on what bracket you get into. I mean, it's not a bad, like I won't pretend to be a a taxation expert. I know it is, it is very difficult and I know people will have strong opinions on it. Um, no matter what, I mean, I, I think the problem is always that, uh, you know, uh, Americans for better or worse are very aspirational. And so anytime I, it's a very classic problem, you know, of, of you, you know, the the common refrain is like tax the rich. Well, everyone wants to be rich. And so they, they don't want to implement a policy. I think that maybe benefits them now and probably for the rest of their lives, but uh, has the offset of either affecting them or their kids. You know, I mean, this comes up with the estate tax all the time, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Where it's like, like the estate tax will never affect you. It's like, it's not going to affect you. Um, But if you happen to become a billionaire or a multimillionaire, um, then it becomes, you know, a major problem. And, you know, I I don't want to minimize that saying like just people are stupid or people are, um, no, no, the, you know, the just have system. no perspective. I, I think for, for better, like that's like part of the American, uh, uh mindset is like, we're just, we're just so almost hopelessly abs- aspirational about what we can do. And, you know, and that causes you to start weird businesses and that causes you to try, to try weird things. Um, but sometimes maybe that's not the best way to make policy. Yeah. Uh, this is one of those conversations that, uh, I really enjoy because there are so many different aspects to it and so many different opinions. And uh, half the time someone's talking about, you can tell them right away, you're, you're full of shit. That's not, that's, (laughs) that's just some stuff you came up with when you were, you know, shitting in the bathroom just now you didn't, this has had no thought put to it in any way, shape or form. And then sometimes you're like, wow, that's why didn't I think of that? And it's the stupidest thing ever, but it's just one little facet on this. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. I would, I'd be interested to see it. I, I would love to see some, uh, some studies on how different uh, possibilities like this scale and where, where that goes. And that's why, um, you know, kind of getting back to, uh, the single dadness, um, that was at least somewhat encouraging in a very, very, very dismal political season in 2016. Um, that, we did hear like in major presidential debates, like both candidates at least paying lip service to like something like uh, paid parental leave or something like that, which I, I, which is like, you know, obviously I bet I would benefit from that. Or if I had more kids, which I am not yeah. 
don't worry, Jackie. Um, <laughs> I like, you know, that, that's a little bit selfish, I guess, on my part at the time. Like, but I, I do think it's very important for society. And th- that's, I guess, my only fear with I mean, it's Andrew Yang, right? He's going to get 2% of the vote and he's going to make maybe one major debate. Um, but I hope that doesn't get attributed um, to just, you know, a, a you know, liberal leftist, you know, fantasy. Like, like let's debate. Like, I, I hope that there is – it doesn't become completely partisan knowing, of course, that it probably already is completely partisan. <laughs> <laughs> but at least, I mean, I, I guess the, the other encouraging thing is at least we'll we'll hear like it brought a little bit more into the mainstream, um, which, again, doesn't guarantee anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Sp- speaking of mainstream, uh, really quickly, Apple decided to update some stuff this week. On Monday, they updated Shh, their Don't iPads. tell anyone. Apple didn't. <laughs> yeah, Apple didn't tell anybody. You just noticed their site went down and came back up. Um, iPad Mini 5 and the iPad Air 3 both with spec bumps, like generational spec bumps in the, in the mini's case. Like it went from a A8 processor to an A12 processor. That's like... There's like a four-year gap. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Um, and by the way, the iPad mini 4 is still running pretty good. We've got like four of them in our house and they all work really well. Um, so the, the, that's, that's exciting. They also have pen support in the iPad Air and the iPad mini now, which it's the old pencil. So it's not the new pencil with the little magnet and the... the <laughs> It's, it's the ugly charging pencil. It's this one with the little uh, pop cap. Yeah. Oh, you have a little cap holder. Yeah, a little cap holder. And the other side how, of this. How actually, much did you pay for that? Ten dollars. Okay. No, no, for the cap holder itself. Yeah, yeah ten dollars. Okay. This so is. And, and, and it came with the little. How tr- much of a value added tax would you pay for that in terms of how how much of a necessity that would be? Well, it's assigned to the Apple Pencil, which is an accessory to the iPad Pro, which is an accessory to anything that you want to do. So probably like a 30, 30 to 40 percent tax on it. I can get behind that. I'm yeah, voting for you. Because uh, that's just that's how necessity <laughs> works. Um and then on uh, on Tuesday they came out with uh, shit. What was it? I I Mac, the AirPods. The AirPods. AirPods yes, the, with the wireless charging. Yeah. Um, and didn't the IMAX get a spec bump too? The next yeah, day? IMAX yeah. Uh, got a spec bump. Uh, they are are now mostly quad core across the board, which was insane that you had to pay like fifteen hundred dollars to get like a quad core Mac up until last week. Um, but uh, yeah, they're quad. They basically have the same platform. It's basically an iPad Mini, but with a discrete GPU. Um, I think, but I think those didn't get a bump. I think they're still using like the RX 550, 560, 570, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, you're not buying an iMac because you had, get a great graphics card, right? Um, it's really weird. I mean, the, I guess the rumble is that they're putting all these out there instead of doing their own kind of little events for these. You know, you you could say like, okay, maybe the maybe the iMac spec bump, right? They don't do an event for. But the AirPod one, I mean, that's a category they're really pushing, right? Accessories. So really weird to me that that didn't get wasn't even thrown in any of it, but the, the scuttlebutt is that their, their whole big services event on the 25th, uh, they really, really, really don't want to clutter that up with any hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you, if you look at Apple's earnings over the past couple of quarters, services are playing a bigger, bigger role. Apple music being, you know, the primary one, um, the blackmail scheme that is iCloud, uh, is also, uh, a growing, uh, concern from them, I imagine. Um, so, you know, clearly the, the pushes for services and like kind of, uh, secondary hardware releases like that, unless there's a redesign, I don't think you're going to see it there. Yeah. And, uh, I mentioned this to a few people earlier this week. I, so Apple's event is on Monday, Tuesday through Thursday are Adobe's event. They're doing a summit on, uh, their cloud offerings and how they've improved it and this and that. I can see a world where Apple waits until the last second to spec bump their lower iPads and their lower machines in order to be in spec with whatever Adobe has to announce later on next week. And especially the iPad mini four or yeah, would not have been able to process or push through whatever services they have. Like maybe they've experienced some, some drops on, uh, uh, you know, video streaming and things like that. And, and that aligns with what they want to push through. I can see all of this tying into Monday's announcement by Apple and later in the week by Adobe. I can see all of it kind of colluding into, you know, we just going to refresh these and get these going through. Well, and the pen support, right? Uh, it, I think maybe speaks to that as well. You know, you yeah. have pen support basically other than the 329 iPad, right? That's the only one that um, doesn't. 
or does that have pen support? I think even even the base model iPad has. I, I think all the iPads now have pencil support. Now, to be clear, none of them come with a pen in the box because no. why would you want a useful accessory like that? No, no, um, but um, as a, a Squid 07 would say, fuck Apple. <laughs> uh, but the interesting, yeah, I, I mean, I can't say that you're wrong. Now, this does that also, though, does tie into, you know, so theoretically, maybe there's an expanded creative cloud uh, offering that uh, is now much more iOS friendly if they came out with maybe a, a audition might be kind of nice. Uh, to have on uh, an iOS device. Maybe then I could justify overpaying for an iPad Pro, which I'm not going to do. But the th- that brings me into my conspiracy theory with uh, Google's recent uh, game streaming announcement for Stadia. I, uh, streaming gaming, I think the jury is still out on how feasible that could be for all types of games. I think certainly yeah. for like uh, uh, turn-based stuff um, or, or stuff that doesn't require you know minute uh, reaction Lazy, times and that kind yeah. of stuff. It probably works, right? I, I think if they can figure out the latency stuff, the we saw some cool tech from Google or whatever. Um, but I, but I think really what their plan is to do is if they can figure out, if they can convince people that they can do streaming gaming, I think their long term plan is actually to move that into a general application platform that they can serve up over Chrome, whether that's through a Chrome OS or just through the browser, basically like that. But gaming is probably the most demand is going to be the most demanding audience. So it's like, OK, if we can prove it to someone that wants to play Call of Duty or Fortnite or I, I don't games that have shooty <laughs> guns uh first person stuff i don't yeah. know what the cool one is now it used to be a uh, crisis that was a long time ago uh, apex, i could never run I think, it i think apex is the one now my 8800 gts could never run it uh so <laughs> the so i but my my conspiracy theory for that is that this whole stadia push is yes they would like to make get into the streaming market and you know kind of uh, get a jump start on maybe killing the next console wars or something like that before they start. Um, but also to be a proving ground for what they want to do maybe with a larger application platform. And so, you know, you don't, you know, you would just have Google stream your Photoshop or Google stream, uh, anything to, you, you don't have to install anything and it just all kind of, uh, is a, a streaming nightmare. Now, so two things. One, I don't think our network infrastructure in the U S is keeping up to the idealism of these streaming platforms. Um, and this is the company that screwed up way or way, <laughs> right? Like they, they couldn't get, they couldn't get people to talk and chat and design things at the same time. So they split it off. And that's when we started getting pages and, and, and sheets and, uh, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know this. This is a company that could figure out the infrastructure and I have no faith in their ability to, to get the games part of it done. And then you've got all these game companies that can get the games done and I don't have any faith they can manage the infrastructure. So so part of this, and this gets into a little bit, I, I, again, I don't want to pretend like I'm an enter- enterprise IT expert. I just talk to them all the time. So I've picked up a few things. But what Google said basically they're doing is they are avoiding the open internet for the streaming as much as possible. And they're running it kind of over their own internal infrastructure that they've developed, pushing it to the closest edge node to you that you can get. And what I think that they're going to be doing is basically creating edge computing sites, right? So instead of punting everything out to, you know, your big AWS or regions, right? I mean, talking about Amazon instead of Google, but, you know, Amazon has like like three or four giant regions in the U.S. where there's these big giant data centers, they do all the computing there and they shoot it back out to where you're going. Mm. So the idea with edge computing would be that it's done, uh, you don't have to send everything to the big data center, right? You can have a smaller data center, which is still immensely powerful, um, do some processing there, you have much lower latencies. And I think theoretically that that's what they're going to be doing right so it's going to they're going to try and make it more of a last mile problem over the open internet and have these these smaller sites that are much closer to customers especially in big markets where they can uh, you know do the processing much closer to the bone and have to compete with the speed of light a little less i mean that that's really what they're coming down to with with all of these streaming services like there's like fundamental physics that's like it takes like so long for light to travel between two points yeah so you're never going to be able to beat that until you start doing quantum computing where you can go multiple different yeah, decisions. Super states. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and uh, this and is this is my quantum computing th- super state. Is that thing. what that is? So if we're yeah, ever in the game of charades, is. that's that's the one you need to use for quantum computing. Um, yeah. but if we can use AI to kind of predispose the actions of the player and then use quantum computing to figure out 
the outcomes of those actions along with the actions of the other players and then kind of retrograde, like drop the, the non choices as you receive information on the choices. Then if that all works, then you're just worried about the speed from your, your home computer or, you know, game system, whatever to your local node. Because, the latency there would be the only latency you have to worry about. And if the AI was good enough and the quantum computing was reined in well enough, you wouldn't even have to worry about that because it would still judge from before that. So it, it would just be the latency from the node to the house. I know, I know, I know. I just went The singularity way. eats us all. That <laughs> right. Point. That's kind of where I was going. And once we can do that, we're just toast. We're, we're, I, we're, I, we're in I, the I matrix also at that say, point. I think there is a very specific reason why Google is pushing for people to develop just for their platform also because I feel like they're going to be doing all sorts of weird uh, – have developers build in like weird buffering schemes where there's just – I, I don't know. It's, it's like more built for a, a streaming kind of platform as opposed to, you know, a console that's five feet from you. So this is going to be the PS3 of non-consoles, the one that nobody can program for and you've got to go through a special. Yeah, they're going to they're going to have. Oh, God, what was the processor name? I forget what it was the called. Core, now. The uh, uh, cell it was a cell processor. Yeah, the cell processor. There you go. Yeah. Oh, my God. I bought a PS3 because I was so I was like in love. I was like, I'm going to run my weird there was like a dog based Linux distro you could run on it and yep. I'm going to do folding at home and then I'm going to play summoner two <laughs> all day. Wait, no, was that a PS2 game? I forget. Anyway, I love the cell processor. I stand the cell processor. Screw you developers. Learn how to program for it. It was awesome. <laughs> it, it really like just from out the gate, it was like amazing. And then about six months after I came out, everybody's like, yeah, we just can't. It's so hard to program for this. And, processor. and now we just have AMD APUs in all of our consoles. <laughs> yeah i'm an amd former fanboy actual fanboy so i approve of this yeah i i was uh i was an amd guy until they started just they couldn't keep up with intel yeah. and then did you, have I, a cl did you have an fx50 claw hammer no my last name my last amd is actually sitting right over there it's an amd x2 or amd2 x64 uh, i don't remember it one was, of their first dual cores? Yeah, one of the first dual cores. And I, I upgraded I that from a single core on the same motherboard. Like, I went ahead and just... Oh, so it was a 939 socket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is how much of a dork. My bucketless computer that I'm never, again, never going to buy, but I will look for on eBay every time. It was the stupid when AMD couldn't make a quad core. And so they developed a motherboard that was basically a server motherboard that had two CPU, two old dual core CPUs on it. I think mm -hmm. it was the FX74 platform or something like that. And I just love how like, just like how, how thirsty AMD was to do quad core. <laughs> it just, it's yeah. just like a horrible idea in every single way, but it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I got a. There's a, been a cheer. I'm told. Yes, uh, Deuce, on, Deuce Gun Wild has cheered 50 uh, uh, salt grains. Apparently, so cool. Thank you for thank that. Thank you, Deuce. Um, uh, yeah, that's. I, I don't know. I don't know what the salt is for, but I'll take it because yeah, everybody could use a little more salt. I've always said you're the salt of the earth. Ah, oh, see, there you go. Um, well, if one, people want to find out about the salt of your earth, where can they go to find you? So you can find me uh, on Twitter at uh, Mr. Anthropology. That's probably the uh, best place uh, to find my stuff. I don't uh, tweet all that often, but you can find that there. Um, I think that's – oh, you can also hear me on uh, Daily Tech Headlines. Uh, if you can tell, I, I, I kind of like my technology. Uh, and I'm – you could check out Daily Tech Headlines six days a week. Uh, but you can hear me usually on Mondays, Wednesday, or Friday, Monday, Fridays, and Saturdays for a week in review. So if uh, you don't get caught up on your tech news, you want to hear that, uh, every Saturday we do a whole week in review. You get it out in five minutes. It's pretty cool. And you hear this voice. You're welcome. <laughs> And uh, for people that listen to DTNS, because uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a few of them in our audience, um, what, what what call sign do you go by on, on, on uh, your feedback there? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you can might recognize me. I was, I am and was and will be rich uh, in lovely Cleveland. There we go. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Ethan Kane, E-T-H-A-N-C-A-I-N-E. -E. You can follow the show at Ritual Misery, R-I-T-U-A-L-M-I-S-E-R-Y. I don't know why I'm spelling shit, but I got it right. So I'm going to go with it. Um, and next week, that's your Ken, field sobriety test. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only one beer down. I, uh, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not even sitting around. Hey, well, by the way, what are you drinking? So I'm drinking a uh, powers gold label because they were out of the 750 milliliter, uh, Jameson on St. Patrick's day. Nice. 
Nice. Is it good? Is it a equivalent? It's pretty good. Uh, it needs to be chilled. It's a little rougher than a Jameson. I still prefer Bushmills Black if I'm going to go with like a affordable Irish whiskey. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, it was interesting. It's more very strong with the honey, uh, which is, is interesting. So I think it might be good to kind of maybe do over soda. Uh, it definitely really, uh, really comes out when you add a little, a little water or just an ice cube or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I was, well, I was drinking a an Alaskan amber in my Alaskan mm-hmm. amber koozie. Very charming. Yeah. Um, is there anything else I can do to disrupt your outro? Probably. We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can submit ideas on our subreddit, ritualmisery.reddit.com. You can find all these links and more ways to support the show and give feedback at our website, ritualmisery.com. We are live. Well, that's why I'm supposed to hit the button. We are live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on diamondclub.tv and twitch.com or yeah, twitch.tv slash ritual misery. Thank you so much to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use your music and thank you for listening for Kent, the absent Kent, for Rich, for me, and for you. This has been your Ritual Misery Podcast. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> R-I-T-U-A-L-M-I-S-E-L-Y.